TV. Computer. For years, these sat in opposite rooms, performing completely different functions. At some point, the bods at Apple decided to take a shot at combining the two, which resulted in this. The Macintosh TV was a complete failure, and is now a very expensive machine to buy today. It's also really rather rubbish, but we're not here to talk about that. Nope. Despite the Macintosh TV falling flat on its arse, the Compu-Televisual dream wasn't entirely abandoned, and made its way into other models as adding cards, right through to the all-in-one Power Mac G3. After that, emphasis was dropped, but I've no doubt that third-party equipment existed. I used something to this effect in 2008-ish. This Elgato ITV hybrid let me stick an Aerial in here, and my Nintendo in here, and play and record it on my iMac. Well, the Apple video system that I thought I'd have a fiddle with today isn't as feature-rich as the Elgato, obviously being a bit older. This dynamic duo slots into various consumer Macs from 1994's 630 here, up to the all-in-one 5500 and 6500 from 1997. It features an RF connector on the top bit, and composite and S-video in on the card. When it's all plugged in with the machine on, a user can launch the Apple TV viewer to view a windowed picture of a resolution of 320 by 240. The system can then double the pixels in a nearest neighbour format to fill out a 640x480 screen. TV on the computer was probably the key selling point here. However, analogue broadcasts in the UK were gradually phased out between 2009 and 2012. Functionality then is limited to whatever I can find that can output to the system's ports. So let's take it for a spin, starting with the composite in. I thought for a laugh we would see what the Wii U looks like, as despite being a product from 2012, it still has the same analogue output as its predecessor. Here we are then, the Waru Waru Plaza in glorious 240p. The audio seemed fine at the time, although I did notice a bit of hissing when I played the footage back. Booting Mario Kart, and I decided to take it online. I got to enjoy the visuals a little more while waiting to join the next race, and aside from text visibility, it really isn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. If it weren't for the slight input lag that I get from my main PC's capture card, this would be playable. I could probably manage against the AI, but online, I opted for the gamepad screen, and then noticed the record button, and that's worth a shot. So, Mute City, 8 other drivers, a solid second place, with just a few turns to go, and... Oh wait, scratch the second place. Well, that's Mario Kart. After recording finishes, the system pretty much locks up while it deals with what I assume is the compression of what it captured. Loading the file it creates opens simple text to play it. I thought it would be quick time. The frame rate here is pretty low, although the resolution is unaffected. This surprised me. I guess I figured it would maintain the frame rate but be of lower res, or a bit fuzzy. The file size of this is nothing by today's standards, but back in the mid 90s this would have gobbled up quite a significant chunk of the user's hard disk. This composite port function was really aimed at people's home video cameras, as opposed to games consoles. Although I wouldn't bill it as a backup solution for video cassettes, just a neat way to digitise some memories, perhaps for creative use, or for a nice desktop background. Maybe grab a single frame or two of a holiday, and email it to family. Ultimately then, I can't see the low frame rate of save footage as really being that big a deal for mid-90s domestic use. I tried Breath of the Wild next, and had a hard time figuring out which direction I was going. No gamepad visual to help out here, and after running around a bit blind and aimless for a while, I finally found and killed something. After getting used to things, it felt like it might actually be playable, and I... Oh wait, scratch that. The dialogue could be in Hylian for all I can tell. One thing that struck me while pratting around with this bomb train was how similar riding it in this resolution felt to the pre-rendered transportation cutscenes from Riven. Clearly an HD console was always going to be downscaled badly, so let's try something with a resolution a tad more appropriate. The Game Boy Advance titles that I looked at were a bit messy, as some pixels had doubled and others hadn't. I think that it's technically being upscaled to 480p by the GameCube, and then back down again by the performer, so it was never going to be great. But text is readable, and I can play uninhibited. The hardest thing here was coming back to old saves I hadn't touched in well over a decade, and trying to remember what the heck was going on. Well, the GameCube's plugged in. Let's try something for that. This is Skies of Arcadia, and I can't see a damn thing. The default video settings don't seem to like dark areas, so a bit of fiddling with the sliders down here was necessary. Text is just about readable, which is pretty important for an RPG, so that's neat. Graphics look blocky, but otherwise passable. What didn't look good was my Mega Drive. I started thinking through possible reasons, including the flat screen that it was on, the fact that it was a cheap model too, or most likely, the capacitors needed changing. It's all very muddy. 
A few days later, I took the performer downstairs for camera footage and tried a different one, which was much better, so I think that mess was console specific. I tried a Mega CD game as well. This is Sylphid, and the visuals here are actually really good. There is no loss in quality here over my TV. It's probably better actually. More early 3D from a PS1 this time. This is Spyro 3, and aside from the on screen words, of course, it looks decent. It's fully voiced too, so nuts to the text. The only computer that I had with Composite Out was my Pi running RISC OS, and as you can see, it's completely unusable. I mean, I can just about feel myself around from memory, but I wasn't expecting this to go well anyway. Let's try something else then. Right at the back of the cupboard under the stairs is a box of old VHS cassette tapes, with various things recorded on them. This should give us an image that was more akin to TV signals of the day. I don't think they've been touched since the early noughties. We're using the RF in, and I don't actually have a proper cable for it. Just this pass through for the Mega Drive, which gives me next to no distance between the two ports it's attached to. It says channel 36 on the box, and after selecting that, I got nothing. Wait, what's... nope, nothing. Well at first I thought that it was either broken or needed a proper cable, but I switched the unit over to DVD mode and boom, a signal, leading me to think I may have damaged the VHS components carrying it upstairs. Reassembled downstairs however, and it started working again. Sort of. I have picture, but I don't seem to have sound. Looks like someone recorded a program about Formula One. This was odd. I tried connecting some composite cables for sound, and got that on its own when selecting it in the TV application, and given that I can output sound to the Elgato through RF, I'm going to assume there's something wrong with the video system's RF modulator. To get this off the cassette then, I had to record the audio and video separately, and then combine them in Premiere. Well, I took the RF unit out to have a good gawp, but I'm not entirely sure what I'm looking at. I found this gunk on the underside of where it plugs in, not sure where that came from. There's no obvious origin and no caps. I gave it a light scrub with isopropyl and did notice that this trace looked a little squiff underneath. Did I do that? Or was it mangled beforehand by the goo? Well, I'm unlikely to find out, but perhaps that's why it's not handling sound. Anyway, from this we can see that PAL transmissions would have looked good enough. We have here a recording of some sort of fantasy drama, and I'm not sure where the heck it's going. Does anyone know what this is? As mentioned earlier though, DVDs are absolutely fine through the composite port. It seems that you can only select one of these options at any one time, so presumably S-Video would by its very nature be silent as well. So that's about everything I can do with this. In summary then, according to a Mac format I scanned, the 630 with TV functionality cost a couple of hundred quid more than one without, and I would say that for the time, it was a decent deal, provided the user actually had use for it. I've seen one set on eBay listed, it's not worth much now, although they don't show up all that often over here. Modern usage is limited to mucking about in the same way that I've been doing, so ultimately it doesn't have any applications that can't be done by something else, a lot better. That said, it's been fun, and I'm glad I have it. Well, if you lasted this long, well done you. If you're new to the channel, you may well enjoy some of the other hardware content I've put together. YY's MG is principally about games for the classic Mac OS, so take a gander at the rest of my channel if that sounds up your street. Otherwise, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe to keep on top of future content. Thanks for watching then, and see you next time.